Greetings! Welcome back to the Old Ways Rising Farm. Um, today we are going to be working on the first steps of hot work in making our Makatage. So what we want to do is we want to get from raw bar to a crude forging such as this. We're going to show all of the steps except for uncoiling the raw material. But I did want to talk about this here at the beginning. So this bar, which I'm going to set here to get warm. Okay, okay, good. That bar used to look like this. This is a piece of coil spring. And in particular, this piece of coil spring came from a hay rake. This is hay rake time. They're doubled. This is half. There was another one right here beside it. And I like to do a lot of work with recycled steel. There are, however, some challenges to this. One is you got to uncoil the thing. That's not too big of a challenge. I'm not going to do that on tape. At some point, maybe we'll do uh, in the skill building series one just on uncoiling these things and working with some of these materials. But this sort of used material always comes with damage, right? Always comes with some damage. Right at the end where it's been in contact with the ground, that's been drug across rock, rock after rock after rock. So you never want to use the last little bit of this it will be stressed and damaged. Okay, so when I use this one, I will just cut that off preemptively. I won't even think about trying. Usually from here to here is a pretty good section. In these coils, these don't accrue a lot of stress because the whole point of the coil is to distribute stress. But right where they touch each other, you'll often have deep pit rusting that you can't see when you're just looking at it. So you want to pay attention to that. Pit rust, if it's deep enough, uh, becomes a, its own type of metal fatigue when you start working it because those pits will expand when you stretch it or collapse into cold shuts when you compress it. Both create flaws in your metal that can lead to breakage. Now the other spot you have to be careful of is, is right in here, this first coil where these meet each other. There's a lot of stress right in that location. So again, when I'm working with this one, I could already see there are some stress cracks in there mm -hmm. before you even start working on it. Um, and in fact, this is not this is not cut. That's a break. That's a fracture. Okay. So we know that this whole last few inches of material is damaged. So when you're working with one of these, you'll stretch it out, cut off that, cut off that. Don't even try. Stretch the rest of it out, and then look. This piece that I'm working on, there's some damage right in here. This last few inches, I left it on as a handle, but that's this, and I can see there's some damage in it. And this piece that I'm using as a pattern, there's a little bit of pit rusting right where my finger is, and I can see, the, the camera won't pick it up, but I can see um, about a dozen places where little bits of rust started to stretch open. Okay? So this is trash. I'm using it as a pattern. It's, it's the size and shape that I want, so it's a nice pattern. But it's trash as a knife blade. It will not work. So there's a trade-off. If you say, I want to use recycled materials, you're also saying, I'm willing to accept 10% failures. Not a hard and fast number, right? You get good at spotting. You do it enough, you practice enough, you'll get good at spotting where those trouble spots are and avoiding them so you don't waste time. But, right, wisdom is, is very often the result of previous poor decisions, okay? And you have to make those poor decisions to get the wisdom. So if you decide to work with recycled material, you're deciding to um, embrace the school of hard knocks and wisdom building in that way. So... It's okay either way. You can make that. You can make either decision, but you have to know what the, what the consequences of the decision you're making are. I use almost exclusively recycled steel. A couple of reasons. One, I like recycling. Right? That's reason in and of itself. Two, I'm a hobbyist. I'm not doing this for profit. Okay. If I was making these things to make a batch to sell. I would not use recycled material. 
because even the most experienced Smith is going to guess wrong on a piece now and then and have one break. It just goes with the game. If I was doing this for profit, I would go to the store, well, I would go to the electronics store and I would order in brand spanking new steel of no composition and no quality. This coil spring steel, it's a nice, it's not high alloy. It's, it's getting a little on the hot side. I'm still talking, so I'm just going to take it out of the fire here. It's not a high alloy steel. It's a nice high carbon, low alloy, basic steel. It's usually 1080, 1090 something. So if you want to do this project and you don't want to take a chance on recycled material, buy 1080 or 1095 brown stock and go with it. Okay? Now this piece of material is ready to go. The first thing I want to do is a little bit of straightening. You don't want to try to be foraging and fighting crooked material at the same time. So always straighten it. The next thing I want to do is I'm going to forge that end from blunt into an angle. If you start out with it blunt, when you start to draw it out and fit it, it's going to fold over and you'll get what's called a bird's mouth, which looks like that. Then if you keep folding it, you get a cold shot. You have to cut the tip off. Okay? So this first heat, I'm just going to forge that end to about a 45 degree angle. That will prevent forming a bird's mouth. temporary portable forge setup. This summer, one of my planned projects is to build a permanent forge. I have all the materials for it, but they're all still in moving boxes, so we're using the temporary one for this. And as you can see, it's not exactly a warm day. We just got up to freezing here today, so it feels balmy compared to the last week when we've been single digits and teens the whole time. But it's not a particularly warm day, so these heats are going to be short and quick. If I get eight or ten blows, I'm happy. I'm going to go right back to the fire. Okay? So, first heat. Okay. Don't hit it when it's cold. Back into the fire. Now, for managing your fire, you want to keep the blow on enough that you're maintaining your temperature, but you don't want forced air onto hot steel any more than humanly possible. You'll decarburize it, you'll burn the carbon out, and that causes a lot of stress on the material, and it will fracture, fracture on you. You do it bad enough, the steel can literally catch on fire, and then if you he hit it, when it's after that's happened, it'll just turn to sand, crumble. And then you get the same words like, gosh golly gee whizzikers, I wish I hadn't have done that. Now the tip is getting really hot. But I'm not getting heat further back where I want to work this piece. So I just stuck the tip. If this is my pile of coal, I stuck the tip out past it a little bit. So the tip is out in the air, and I'm heating the middle of the bar. Now 
You'll get the most heat in your metal where it's covered by the pole. Okay. Back in. Cold days like this, that's about all you get. This black flaky stuff you see coming off is black iron oxide, mill scale. You want to keep your anvil clean from that. Ooh, ouch. Okay. I have found a flaw in this piece of metal. Right where I was drawing out. Right here where I'm pointing. I'll put that against the anvil there. Right there where I'm pointing. There was a flaw in that piece of metal that just opened up. I see another one right behind it. So there's just, there's just a bad spot in that. So we're going to cut that off. You don't try to fix it. Steel's cheap enough these days, you don't need to fix and try to fight with bad metal. centers where steel was hard to find. Well, I'll finish my story in a second. Drive most of the way through, not all the way through. The last little bit kind of snap off. I am dropping all of my toys today. That is all you can do when you find one of those. Now we'll start again. Now I was starting to say in the old days, when you're away from an urban center where steel was hard to come by, especially steel, a piece like that you wouldn't throw out. You would... Same process. Goes faster when you're not talking about it, doesn't it? A piece like that you wouldn't totally throw away. You would take it, you would flatten it, you would stack it, and you would forge weld it to a bunch of other pieces, fold it a time or two, and that process would weld everything back together.
I could sometimes get free from farmers. At most, I paid like a quarter a pound for it. So it ain't worth it. I'm just using a small, I bet that's a one or one, one and a half pound head at most. Get it all straight. One of the tricks to doing good work and not hating life when it comes to the finishing time is to make sure that every step is straight, true, plumb, correct before you advance to the next step. Now, I just want to double check everything here. I've got plenty of blade length. I don't have quite as much width as I want, but it's okay for now. Okay. Next thing I'm going to do is come back at a heat so that it's hot right here. We're going to cut this and I'll start drawing the tank. It's going to take a minute to heat. Just to define terms, drawing out is when you're making something longer and thinner or wider and thinner. You can draw for length, you can draw for width. Um, upsetting is the opposite of that. When you're taking something and you're making it fatter and shorter is upsetting. Or when you screw up, that's also upsetting, but different definition. Okay, you can see my pattern. Blade the length, blade the width of the anvil. <laughs> About four inches. Three inches more. Yeah. Tang the, the width of the anvil. Right? We are ready to go. Another cut. Now this, I want the tang to be cut here. Two-thirds of its finished length. We're going to taper this out. a nice long taper so it's going to get longer but only so much longer and for a nice long taper like this two thirds you'll see what this one clubs for in a bit two thirds of two thirds of its finished length is about right for the type of taper that I'm going to draw so I just measured from the edge of the anvil to the edge of the hardy hole. That's about two-thirds of my anvil face width. Like I said, if you could match up tools made by Smith and tools owned by Smith, 
your sizes are going to match. Okay. Now I'm just using the, the flat of this anvil, this this hammer, for this drawing. Because this is a small job. If this was a bigger job, I would get a peen. Get a get an anvil get an anvil. Words. Get a hammer with a long peen or draw it over the horn. Or both. It's a really heavy work. I'll use a heavy um, double peen hammer and I'll also draw over the horn. So you have that roundness, that convexity there to help you get the width. But for a little job like this, I find that using a peen tends to create more problems than it solves, so I just use a small flat hammer. It is a little bit less efficient, but okay, got my length. It's a little less efficient, but you see how taxing that wasn't, right? And it just, I like it better. Personal preference. Now I'm gonna get a gentle heat on this and I'm gonna planish this out. Like I said, always make sure that, always make sure that what you just did is straight, true, smooth, and plumb before you move on to the next step. something get woogity in step one, it's only going to get worse, step two, three, four, and five. So here I'm not changing shape, I'm just smoothing. Be 
real careful of our temperature control with all these little little pieces. Okay, got to make sure I bend it the right way. So that's cursed, so it needs to bend back that way. So I can just put that there. Get it straight, and now we'll check it. Okay, model. I'm trying to hold this so I don't endanger myself, and you can see it. Model in piece. Okay? See, if I do it now, it's simple. It's very easy. I need to bend it about another three or four degrees. About another five degrees. A little bit of heat on it. careful about temperature control on these little pieces. Really, really careful. Cool that off. Just stick it in the snow in a minute. <laughs> the joys of living you, up north. <laughs> yeah, the joys of living up north. On a scale from 1 to 5, the fire hazard today is negative 80,000. So I just need to tap this down just a little bit more. Bad okay. grip. I do not want to send this off flying into the snow and get an accidental water quench. That's never good. And yes, I have done it before. Yes, I have done it before today. <laughs> okay, that's the right angle. Now, now that that bend is in, now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to draw the whole thing out for final width. But you do the bend first. to bust on anybody. If you don't do a lot of curved work and, and actual traditional blacksmithing, you don't ever really have to do this sort of stuff. A nice little bend there. We're starting to flatten it out, forge the final shape here. to draw the edge angle. 
and this is going to be a chisel edge. The top is going to be completely flat. And then the bevel will be on the bottom of the blade connecting to a flat across here. So that's going to be... Now it will be more acute than what I'm currently doing with my little finger puppet. Okay. There you can see there's the there's the start, that little facet that I'm hammering into it. There's the tip. Okay. Just let it soak a minute there in the heat. Again, we want to keep as much of the blast off of the, the fragile spots as humanly possible. So. I really enjoy doing these sorts of little projects. It's a lot of fun. It's not real taxing. It's kind of a pain in the neck to get things on coils. But it's just slow and tedious. It's not taxing. And you can just have a nice relaxing day with your forge. Okay. Now, do you see how this edge is starting to get a little bit of a concavity? Down? Is it in the frame? Do you see how that edge is starting to get a little bit of a concavity to it? That commonly happens when you're drawing the edge. That's why I'm not worried about that, because it's going to self-reverse. And I'm going to have to correct this after another one or two heat. If it doesn't fully self-correct, that's what a file is for. for like 10 bucks at a yard sale, literally. You can see what it is, it's just, it's just a scrap. Somebody got their hands on a scrap of chrome tan and just put a couple straps on it. You don't need a fancy apron, but you do want some good PPE. instead of a metal clobber knocker is it's not going to dent that fine edge. You can just use a baseball bat. You can... I whittled on this stick a little bit. You don't have to. Right? You can just get a branch. 
He got a piece of two by four. Don't overthink simple stuff. Oh, but I'm so good at that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm good at overthinking too, believe me. Okay. Just gotta draw this last little bit there. at our final edge and we'll start doing the final final truing and checking when the truing and checking is done the last step is is what's called normalization so at some point here I will do a uh, video just on heat treating okay. uh, probably a short version in this series and a longer explanation all in and of itself. But as you're hammering on this material, you're building up stresses. And those stresses are coming from crystal defects in the lattice created by the iron and the carbon atoms. hammer it, those, those defects are little internal cold shuts, basically. Very, very tiny, like invisible, invisibly tiny, but, but there. And as you hammer it, they start to grow. And they start to grow, and they start to grow. And that's where you get green growth from. The expansion of those defects. Not quite hot. A little bit of air on that. When you heat the material up and then let it cool slowly, that situation will correct and they'll shrink. It also softens the material. So we will heat it up to critical temperature and let it cool in the air. And I usually do this twice before I file it. twice more before I heat treat it after it's been filed. Often, after you start to grind it, when you heat it up again, it will still have a lot of internal stress in it. And you'll put it in dead straight, because it was just filed and ground smooth. You'll put it in the heat, and it'll bend on you. Right? Because it was under pressure, and now that you've heated it up, you let off that tension. And the piece recoils a small amount. so bright and you can see the colors a little bit better. But about the first three of those blows, we're actually moving metal and then I lightened up and was just planishing a little surface defect that I saw there. Could you explain what planishing is? Planishing is light hammer blows at a moderate temperature. I'm going to draw and then when it's too cool to forge and I just do those light straightening taps or if it's already straight and I'm just smoothing it a little bit and that's planishing. So you forge at cherry red bright cherry red, you planish at dull cherry red, and then you can still bend at a very dull red. Bend lightly, not a severe bend, but a little bit. So is the color As the color is changing and the metal's losing heat into the anvil, 
I'm, I'm changing my objective. So I'll get two or three when it's this cold, right? This is still cold to the touch. Mm -hmm. um, hang on, I gotta watch my watch my material here. I'm constantly changing what the objective of a particular hammer blow is to match the conditions. If you try to move metal too quick, you'll expand those little defects that cause the grain to occur into true fractures. There's no coming back from that without forge welding. But that won't happen when you're just doing a little bit of planning. And if you try to planish too hot, you just put big dents in it, so it's not really effective. So yeah, forging temperature, planishing temperature, bending temperature back in the fire. So I was using the round peen a bit. We need to do one more heat there. We're very close to finish with this. One, maybe two more heats in that little spot. Final straightening and normalize. erased itself. Here, it bent out into a banana shape. There, because there was that little concavity, convexity, mm -hmm. it just straightened out instead of bending into a banana shape. forge a little bit. You always got to have some very, very lame blacksmith in there too.
good as that didn't hit the snow. There we are. Okay. Let's check your work. Before we move on. Good. We have a rough origin. Now, normalize. Putting it in the fire, it's very, very hard to judge temperature out in the full bright sunshine like we are. Okay? Very difficult. It's much easier to do this indoors. But what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at the color of the metal as a comp Still, thank goodness that didn't hit the snow. <laughs> Hit a piece of coal that was sitting down here. <laughs> um, and it did not cool down from red hot. So it didn't quench. Scared me. Scared me. Um, but I'm looking at how the color of the metal compares to the color of the coals as reference. When the metal is the same color as the coals in whatever light, it's a critical temperature. The surface coals, at a certain layer, the, the neutral layer of the fire. It's white hot deep down in, right where the blast is coming. I'm not talking about that, and it's dull red right where you have a half burnt coal. But right at that neutral layer, when the metal is the same color as the coals, it's ready. You're gonna make sure it gets a good even heat all the way across the whole blade, the whole tang.
the metal is telling you how much stress is in it. twice after cold work, okay, at a minimum. Now this one, I had to heat three times to get it to hold it straight, right? So those don't count. Those don't count. It's only the good ones that count. Uh, but that's my normal, the, the first part of my normal heat treat process is two normalization cycles before filing and cold work, two normalization cycles after. It takes time, okay? Um... And this is, this is how you prevent cracks and warps when you quench it. If you quench it, I mean, it's a, you probably couldn't see it on the camera, but it was bending about three degrees and relieving that stress and that tension in the metal. If you take that and quench it, it's going to bend a lot more. Okay, because that, you're going to amplify that stress. You have to get rid of all of that stress before you quench it. Okay? Or you'll just create more problems for yourself down the road. It takes time. You can't rush it, and you can't put it on a clock and say, here's the deadline. It takes time. And this goes double when you're using recycled steel, because I, I usually don't have to do it that many times, but for some reason, that piece of metal had a little extra tension, and it could be stress that build up during its useful life as a hay rake. It could be stress I put in during foraging, it could be stress that was there before we even started to forge, right? So that's the, uh, the first part of the hot work. So I hope that you will go give this video a thumbs up so that others can see it. And I hope that you will join us for the next video when we proceed with this project. Have a wonderful day, everybody.